Good evening, all. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am Srili Kapale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Community Engagement. Our goal through this program, Conversations That Count, is to bring in candidates and community leaders and influencers to have thought-provoking conversations and perspectives on key issues facing our communities and nation with a goal to build next generation of conservative influencers and leaders. This week, I have invited Stephen Sutton. Mr. Sutton joined the Leadership Institute 14 years ago as a Vice President for Programs, where he restructured Leadership Institute 40 plus training programs, starting from political grassroots to student groups on college campuses. Steve now serves as Ally's first senior vice president, where he focuses on training and mentoring the next generation of conservative leaders. Prior to joining Leadership Institute, Steve was the chief of staff in the House of Representatives for more than 14 years. He became a startup specialist as he set up the congressional offices for four different incoming freshman candidates. Steve is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and has a bachelor's of degree in mechanical engineer. We, you will be very um, thankful that we are having this conversation, especially if you're interested in learning more about how to become a better conservative leader or how to learn about uh, campaigns or if you want to run in the future. Steve, welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you, Sheree. It's great to be with you. Great to be with you, Steve. I know I spoke to you for a few minutes before the show started, and I'm already excited that you all come with wealth of knowledge. So Steve, you have uh, over 30 plus years of political experience on both conservative campaigns and non-for-profit organizations. How has poli uh, politics evolved over time? It's a great question. And uh, I'm glad that you asked how has politics evolved uh, because I think uh, on our side, people tend to come into public policy through policy because uh, we're more motivated by issues and the issues are what matters, whatever issue it might be, the education, fiscal policy, international relations, and that's what motivates us to get involved. And sometimes we don't pay attention to the politics rather than the policy, and those are separate. Uh, I think that we have come a long way in the political side, uh, particularly where we understand the importance of the politics. Uh, we think that as long as we're right on policy, we're going to win because who could who could disagree with 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 the policy that we that's not the way it works the politics have to be right and you need to look at things politically uh, first of all to win election but then also to get things done and so i think we've come a long way in the last uh, 20 30 years building uh, conservative republican uh, infrastructure so that the politics can match uh, the policy. And, we, and that's why we're, we've been more successful uh, recently in the last 20 or 30 years compared to the previous, when Republicans, for example, for 40 years, they were in the minority in the House of Representatives. Uh, that's changed and, uh, and that's a good thing. And I think it's gonna change very big uh, in a big way this November and in 2024 as well. Steve, I'm, I'm super excited about what you just said about midterm elections. We'll talk more as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, so Steve, you helped with, uh, each congressman get reelected to uh, direct, you can directed their campaign strategies, messages and voter contact programs. And uh, it's my understanding that you manage numerous political campaigns from city council to US Congress, specializing in challenger campaigns. I guess one of the questions that I wanna ask is, as we go along the conversations, we'll talk a lot about uh, uh, candidates that are just going to run, right? New candidates. Mm -hmm. But um, what are the unique challenges you face when you are working with congressmen or even city council members for that matter? Um, while running for the re-election campaign? Are there different challenges? Um, there are. Um, when I became a, the chief of staff to the four different members, I was always coming in from the outside. I had not worked on their campaign. They were looking for a chief of staff when they came to Washington. So I didn't have the benefit of knowing the campaign that they ran, knowing the districts, knowing the people, and uh, and it, it can be difficult when a person's been elected to 
to uh, convince them they should do things a little differently because they just got elected. So they're very smart. Uh, they've been successful and uh, they got elected without you. So what do they need you for? They just want you to manage the office. Well, uh, sometimes they are elected in a tide, a tidal wave election. And as we all know from the tides, this is my Naval Academy and Navy background speaking, what the tide washes in, the tide will also wash out. So you have to be careful uh, if you win on a, on, on a, uh, in a, in a wave election, that wave can sweep you out to sea uh, when the pendulum swings, to mix the metaphor. So there's a challenge there, and you just have to build up some credibility so that they uh, will listen to you. That's why I liked working on challenger campaigns uh, when, I, when I was working on campaigns more than working in, in, for congressmen, because in challenger campaigns, they seem to be more open to the ideas. Uh, incumbent campaigns, they tend to be a little more entrenched and it's more difficult. My attitude was if, if you're an incumbent and you need help, maybe I can't help you. Yeah, no, Steve, I think that is the right attitude, right? I think coming from a naval background, you probably have great organizational leadership where you're saying that running is one thing, winning is one thing, but getting reelected is also a challenge. And one of the reason I ask is, uh, we want to make sure we hold on to our candidates that actually won. We want them to continue to win. Otherwise, we're going to start from scratch again. So it's always fascinating to know what their culture and what their mentality is. You never and, want to be overconfident. And I don't, I don't want to suggest that you should do whatever it takes to get reelected, because that's the only thing that's important. And uh, you, you, could, you should even compromise your principles to do so. That's not, that's not what I'm suggesting. Uh, and, and sometimes that's what people hear, but that's not what I mean at all. Um, a quick example, uh, the first member of Congress I worked for was the only member in New England. This is back when they had Republicans in Massachusetts, but he was the only member of Congress from either party in New England to vote against the assault weapons ban, because that was back the we got him reelected. That was not popular. So you, you can stand up for principle and still get a, elected, but you have to understand the politics that's going on and how to, to deal with the way you vote. Each member, all four, I told them, I'm never going to tell you to vote yes or no on anything. I'm not even going to recommend it. I'm going to say, if you vote yes, these are the landmines, potentially. If you vote no, these are the, and, I'll, and as chief of staff, we'll handle it politically. But just so the member knows that it, it, if it's a tough vote, why it's a tough vote. And then they, they vote their conscience and we, we live with that. That's fine. Yeah. It's really nice to know what is the chief of staff job, job description is, right? I, I almost thought chief of staff means you're managing his staff, but not advising. It's good to know that there is that uh, a higher level of responsibility of advising on bills. So Steve, in your past career, it looks like you also advised on everything from fundraising to campaign leadership to conservatives who are actually not involved in political process in the sense who are planning to run, but really not involved yet. So when you're coaching these, I call them as newbies, conservatives, what is the common theme that you found that you wish you, they should have known this. I mean, sometimes I, I, I work as a director in my organization. There are many a times where I'm like, hmm, I assumed you knew this, but never make those assumptions. So what is the common thing that you find? Well, with people who are thinking of running for office, um, they sometimes, uh, I, didn't, I did not understand politics until I started getting involved in it because you, th you think that you make a speech and the best ideas win, and it's really not like that. Um, there, are, there are multiple sides to every issue. And uh, we, there's an old uh, expression, conservatives win every debate and lose every election. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I think it's important to get elected. And there are techniques and tactics to do that without compromising principle. And it's just learning those things and understanding that there's something to that. Uh, many candidates are very successful in their private lives, and, and they think because of that, they're going to be a successful candidate. Well, they need advisors. They need people who have gone through it and understand. Uh, and one of the things that they really need is they, they need a community. They need to be well-known in the community. 
there are two types of candidates. There are candidates who run to be somebody, and then there are candidates who run to do something. And the voters can tell very quickly, well, if you want to convince people that you are running to do something, you should have done something. So we encourage people to get involved in their community, and it doesn't have to be politically. One of my favorite candidates in Nashville, Tennessee, who I helped, uh, he, he has two daughters, and when they were old enough, uh, they wanted to play basketball in an organized bas basketball league, but the boys' league would not let them play in the boys' league. So this person started a girls' basketball league. Now, that's not political. That's not blockading an abortion clinic or something. Um, it's just getting involved in the community. When he decided to run many years later, he had dozens of parents who adored him and, uh, and, and they, they helped him, not because of his position on certain policy, but because they, they knew him. They knew him to be a hardworking, honest person who put his community first and his family first. And that's the type of person they wanted representing them. And so those make the best candidates, people involved in the community. And uh, we have a school at the Leadership Institute, the Future Candidate School, where we talk about that over a four day period, how you get involved in the community, raise money for charities and other organizations, because those people will become your fundraisers when you run, and just how to, how to do that, how to get involved in the community so that you will be a strong candidate should you decide to run. Absolutely. I think you said you said it so very well, candidates that run to do something or to get somewhere. Um, I think that's one thing that I keep telling the candidates saying that make a name for yourself. It can be anything. I mean, be part of um, uh, some community services board. I mean, Rotary Club, whatever your passion is, as long as you are well known in community in some way based on your philosophy, not necessarily political philosophy. So now that's amazing. So Steve, I mean, if you kind of look around 2021 was the year when the enrichment of a divisive left-wing ideology into every aspect of American society, even into the classroom. So of our children, I'm a mom, my daughter goes to FCPS, so I've seen it uh, firsthand. Unfortunately, many school boards are now used as social engineering tools instead of focusing on preparing our children for higher education and the skilled workforce. So does the um, Leadership Institute do any training so parents can indeed start running for the school boards? I think that's going to be a critical thing in 2023. As a matter of fact, that's one of the new schools we've added in the last year or so. And that's a school board candidate training school. And because we developed it during COVID, we actually uh, put the entire school online. I think there's 21 lectures. So if somebody was interested, they could go to leadershipinstitute.org, our website, and they could uh, view any of those 21 lectures or all of those 21 lectures I think free of charge, uh, but if, if there's a cost, it would be nominal. But I don't know that there's a cost because we decided to put that entire school online because it was during COVID. Okay, that's very, very good to know. I hope that uh, there are several school board members that I know or several uh, parents or moms that I know are planning to run. Hopefully they'll take advantage of it. And we so, work closely with uh, Moms for, there are many organizations, but Moms for Liberty is one of the largest now. And they just had their uh, uh, convention or conference in Florida. And we did the training at that conference. So we work very close with them and, uh, uh, and other groups. And if, if someone has a group and they want us to do training for them, they should contact us. Yeah. So Steve, how, how many uh, people are, do you expect? Because I know that uh, I, as I said, I'm a grassroots organizer uh, for Fairfax GOP. I do a lot of work with 11 congressional districts. So in case uh, we decide to go down that path, what, what is the number that you're looking for? In, in what way? How many people we uh, how many train people? somebody? Yes. Well, the closer it is to LI, the smaller, the, you know, if, if you were living in uh, CA, out of Washington, the, the minimum might be higher because we have to fly trainers out to you. If it's, if it's doing something in Fairfax, Virginia, well, the Leadership Institute's headquarters is in Arlington, Virginia. So uh, that, that would be much easier with probably a lower threshold. I've done trainings with as few as 10 to 15 people. I'm now work, uh, living full-time in South Carolina. And so I do trainings on the weekend for small groups 
that I can drive to from my home in South Carolina. So um, uh, it just depends on what, what the resources are and, and what the availability is and, and, and how busy we get. Got so it. If you, if you're, yeah, go ahead. If you're interested, you should call someone at the Leadership Institute. That would be the grassroots department and uh, ask for Robert Arnakis. Uh, but, but anyone could take the call and uh, find out what you're interested in doing. Is it a three-hour school or is it a two-day school? I mean, those are the types of things that would uh, make a difference in the size and how many people we would train. Steve, as you know, next year is a big year for us. We have about 50, 52 positions open that we, uh, we will have um, to recruit candidates and fill. So we'll definitely kind of reach out to you. So uh, Steve, we just talked about how school boards around the country are captured by the left. Uh, um, this includes actually large urban districts where leftists are expected to control school politics or local politics, as well as actually more suburban areas where the nonpartisan nature of school board election leads actually many conservative voters. And I've been, a, um, I've been on the receiving end of this to cast ballots for leftist candidates because they call it as nonpartisan. They say things right. And then once they get into the board, then all hell breaks loose. So uh, that perplexes me that even conservative voters in suburban areas goes and votes for leftist candidates thinking that it's a nonpartisan. So has the Leadership Institute discussed this and should the messaging be taught differently to capture these voters' attention so they know what they're getting into? Yes, um, when we do our campaign schools, this question comes up in every school. So we, we address it and, and we talk through that. Um, I don't like this answer for most questions, but it depends. There are many school board elections around the country that are partisan. And so you, you can vote for the Republican or Democrat. In South Carolina and in many other states, they are nonpartisan. And what we're seeing, and this goes to your very first question, what's the, what's the state of affairs uh, uh, in the conservative community now? It's gotten so much better. And so in the nonpartisan races, we're seeing more and more Republican party clubs endorsing candidates, even in nonpartisan races. In fact, I, 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 I'm, I'm working with a few people uh, here who wanna know how to do that. So uh, I'm meeting with them and, and uh, coming up with, with ways to do that. The other way would be to have a conservative organization, not the party. There are still many people in the party reluctant to endorse in nonpartisan races because they're nonpartisan. And so uh, rather than trying to convince them otherwise, just uh, form a conservative group. And that's where Moms for Liberty and other groups like that are, are coming into, or a pro-parent group. It doesn't have to be conservative. I equate those two together though. And, and they can endorse. And so if you're, if you're running and you get endorsed by a third party, it's telling voters because everyone's going to sound like a conservative this year. Everyone. The, the farthest leftist leftist is going to talk about how pro-parent they are, and we're not teaching CRT in the schools, and uh, they're going to sound like a conservative because they're not stupid. They know if they actually campaign truthfully, they're going to lose. And so it takes a third party to step in and say, Here's our endorsed candidates. And then the candidates can use those endorsements very effectively. And I think we're seeing that on a very large scale this year. And I just think there are gonna be many, many, many victories that are gonna surprise a lot of people in November, even in nonpartisan races. Absolutely. Uh, Steve, all of a sudden being conservative has become cool <laughs> with all the chaos Biden has created. So uh, Steve, let me talk about your expertise. I mean, you raise funds. I mean, as a allies vice president for development, you increase revenue from $7 million per year to $24 million in a span of a decade, uh, which I think is kind of amazing. Right? I have run for office. I know one of my biggest challenge was raising funds. I think that is the biggest challenge for most candidates. I can't imagine one candidate ever telling me that, oh yeah, don't worry about that, I got it. <laughs> so of course, raising candidates uh, funds as a candidate is different from re increasing the revenue, but on the same token, I thought you ought to have some similar skills. So what do you think? What, what, what is the best tip that you can give for our candidates listening to the show? Well, I really enjoy teaching people how to raise money because I came to LI 15 years ago as vice president for programs. And uh, about a year or so after 
uh, I was reorganizing a lot of the programs, our, our president, Morton Blackwell, asked me to become vice president for development. And uh, as I like to tell the story, it's kind of funny. Morton asked me and I said, no, thank you, because that's not my background. My background was campaigns and grassroots organizing and politics. So a month later, he asked me a second time and I said, hell no, thank you. And then about a month later, he asked me a third time and my wife explained to me, he's a Southern gentleman from Louisiana. This is his way of telling you. And uh, so I accepted, and, uh, but I had to learn how to do it because it wasn't my background. I knew a little bit about fundraising, but not nonprofit fundraising. So it took me some time to learn it. So now I, I love to teach it because I found that the uh, perceptions I had were wrong. Everyone hates, dreads raising money. They hate to ask for money. Well, if that's the case, you're probably doing it wrong, quite frankly. And so there are things you can learn how to do it. I loved raising money until last year when Morton made me the senior vice president. So now I'm not doing it anymore. But, um, and as you said, we went from 7 million uh, to 24 million, actually 24 million in 2020. Last year we raised 29 million. And so, and I think we're gonna break 30 million this year. So there are techniques to, to do it. But again, it's related to what we said, talked about earlier, building a community of people. And if you don't know anyone, I had a call from a gentleman, I'm thinking of running for office, but I don't know anyone and I don't have any money. What do I do? And I said, you should not run for office. There's no solution to that. You need a, a, a good name in the community. And if you have that, you'll be able to raise money. Yeah. Because the people who want to see you elected will raise money for you. You'll have to train them how to do it. But there are techniques, and again, we teach that in our fundraising schools of how, how to do that. And there are methods and they work. Absolutely, Steve. I think I think you said it right. I mean, you were very candid in saying, if you don't know anyone, then probably you should first uh, get to know your community, its issues, work for the community, uh, serve the community and then run, then you have people there. But Steve, let me ask you something. Do you divide this training based on small and large donors? The reason I ask is as a unit, I mean, our unit is no different. All the units, I think we all kind of struggle to raise this and we try to understand, uh, should we uh, spend our time on small donors? Should we spend our time on large donors? Is there a different, different tactic that, uh, that gets deployed to grab the attention of large donors? That's or have doing. folks make recurrent donation? How do you do that? Well, uh, it's a great question because it, it, it strikes at the heart of what you should be doing. You should prioritize your time. You only have so much time. And so you need to prioritize your time with the people with the greatest potential. Now, whether those are large donors or small, we could talk about, but every organization should determine what a major donor is. And that dollar amounts different for different organizations. When I first started fundraising for Leadership Institute, a major donor was anyone who gave us $1,000 or more. Now it's $10,000 or more because we've grown so much. But for your organization, a small organization, it might be $500. And so you do want to treat them differently, develop a relationship with them, because if someone can give you 500, they can give you another 500. And they could probably give you two or 3,000. And they're not stretched usually. Now that said, you still have to pay attention to the small donors because that's where your big donors come from. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you how many times someone started donating to Leadership Institute through direct mail, which does still work. And they started donating at $100 or less. And now those are our major donors because we have cultivated the relationship and built the relationship over time. And what you can focus on is uh, people will upgrade through the mail slowly over time. You want to upgrade them more quickly by meeting with them, but you have to prioritize. And so th there's an important part of uh, researching your small donors and seeing who has the ability to donate more. Uh, we get $50 donors from people who we find out are multimillionaires because they're testing you. They're, they're not going to send you, they don't send you $100,000 in the envelope the first time they get a letter from you. They're kind of kicking the tires on the car and they're trying to test, they're testing you. How will I be treated? Is this organization with it? Do they have successes? Am I making a difference? Does my support matter? 
And those are the things you have to convey in your literature, in your discussions. Um, and, and so there's, again, there are techniques to doing that. We have a four day fundraising school and, uh, and, and we focus on that. It's a great school. People should, uh, if, they're, if they're professional fundraisers or thinking of doing more in fundraising, they should take that school. And uh, we go into great detail on doing donor events, pros and cons, direct mail, pros and cons. The best and the fastest way to raise money is one-on-one. -on -one. You know, there's an old joke that uh, the, the best fundraiser is the $1 million per ticket fundraiser, because you only need to sell one ticket. <laughs> well, it's yeah. the same thing. If you're meeting with someone, you can raise a lot of money quickly with one-on-one -on -one meetings, but you need the two A's. You need, they, are, they have to show affluence, but they also have to show affinity for your organization. So a list of the top 50 richest people does you no good because there's no affinity for your organization. So that's why your best donors come from your current donors. So look at your current donor base and see who has the affinity for your organization, if they've been donating for multiple years, if they've donated more than once a year, that's a good indicator. So more than once a year for more, many years, no matter what the amount is, and, and research those donors and try to get meetings with them. And you'll be surprised how quickly, uh, if you have a, a donor base, you'll be surprised how quickly you'll raise more yeah. money. Well, Steve, what, what pulse of wisdom. I, I mean, I think the more I hear, the more I think I'll probably step in for the four-day fundraising school for sure this year or next year. Great. So, Steve, before I invite anyone to conversations that count, I actually go in and listen to their videos uh, because I want to make sure I, I know what content they they talk about and so on and so forth. One of the videos that I watched, I was truly impressed when you spoke about four piece of excellence. I, I, I'm not sure if you remember that at all, but I would love, if you do remember, I would love for you to elaborate on that. I think our viewers, audience, whoever listened to this will benefit from that. Well, oh, terrific. Well, it's uh, um, something that we started, I started talking to the interns when I was vice president for programs at LI, the interns were one of the programs. And I thought, um, I, I, I think there's some uh, foundational education that they need to uh, uh, get better on. So I developed the four P's of excellence and they are uh, philosophical. And yes, that begins with a P, uh, philosophical, policy, politics, and personal. Mm. And just very quickly, I found that many people who came to LI uh, they, were, they were good on issues, but they didn't understand why. So why are you pro-life? Why are you pro-gun? And after one or two questions, they kind of fell apart and they really couldn't answer that. And often it was, well, my parents were conservative, so I grew up that way. And I'm not sure that's enough. So I think you need to study the philosophy of conservatism. Why are you conservative? It's very important. And that involves a little bit of history and it depends on how far back you want to go. If you want to go back to uh, uh, the founders and, uh, uh, and, and, and others, uh, great thinkers from Great Britain in the 1700s and Adam Smith and, uh, and all, the, all that, um, or just to uh, uh, Buckley and, uh, and, and uh, Russell Kirk. But there, there needs to be a better understanding from philosophically. Second, um, policy, it's a little different. Policy is current policy. I would often ask uh, interns, what's your most important issue? And then I would say, okay, tell me two or three things about that issue right now. What's happening with that issue? And they couldn't tell me. I, I'm pro-life, but they couldn't tell me what the, uh, is, uh, uh, What's, what are the bills that are the left trying to push? What do they, what's, what's going on now? At the time it was partial birth abortion and they, and they didn't really know, they didn't even know what that was and they're just pro-life, not good enough. So if it's, if, you're, if it's your most important issue particularly, you should know a little bit more about it. So they need to study a little more about the policy. The third P is politics. And we've already talked about that briefly. The politics and the policy have to match up in order for anything to get passed legislatively. And they are different and they are distinct. Incoming freshman members of Congress are told in orientation, you can do policy 
or you can do politics, but wow. you can't do both. And they think they can because they're geniuses. They just got elected to Congress, but they're diametrically opposed. If you're going to be in the Freedom Caucus, and you're going to be doing politics. You may not get on the A committees to do policy because leadership may not trust you. Conversely, if you're doing policy, well, you may have to vote for some bills that you politically might uh, you might not want to. So, so and that's a, a quick ex expression of that. But the politics have to match, and you'll make yourself a much better and more valuable staffer if you do policy and politics. If you understand the nexus between the two, I had a long discussion with an intern who was applying to be a legislative assistant to a U.S. senator, and I explained to him in more, much more detail over about an hour the politics part of being a legislative assistant. He had his interview and he got the job and he said, that's what they, everyone else came in and they were a policy expert, but nobody had the political understanding that he, he now had. And so they hired him and, and it makes a difference. I was a political chief of staff as opposed to a policy chief of staff. And I think we need more of that. And that's why Leadership Institute training is, is so important. And then the fourth and final P is personal. Um, when we're do, running campaigns, um, you got to take care of your health. Uh, if you're a candidate or working on a campaign, they are grinding and uh, you do them cycle after cycle. It takes a toll. You got to take care of your health. You have to take care of your, retire care of your retirement. Campaigns do not uh, help you contribute to an IRA. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no matching retirement plan. Uh, I know several political consultants who after a career as a political consultant, they have zero saved to retirement. And that's, that's not good. So you, you've got to take care of the personal and then also family. That's part of personal. Um, being in politics can be very grueling on the family, just like being in the Navy was tough on the family. And so you've got to pay attention to the personal. And, uh, and sometimes, particularly young people, they poo-poo that, but it, it's something. So those are the four P's of excellence. Excellent, Steve, that's, that's pretty impressive. I hope uh, more people get to kind of listen to that and take it into heart. Uh, there's a very good reason I have a lot of respect for what the Leader, Leadership Institute does, uh, thanks to leaders like you. I personally think it is a very fine organization that exists to help uh, conservative advance their personal and professional goals. You just elaborated on that. Uh, I mean, if I could go to the extent to say it's truly the human resource department for the movement uh, that we are trying to do as grassroots conservatives. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Steve, my question is, are there any other organization within the conservative world that do the similar work? What about something like PragerU? Do they do the similar work or is that completely a different organization? I, I'm only familiar with the videos they do, the YouTube videos, uh, which are just outstanding. And I, I think that's the way they advance conservatism, but it's persuasion conservatism, which is not what LI does. We train people already conservative uh, how to be more effective persuading others. Um, many organizations have begun to do training. Uh, I think LI was the first, founded in 1979 with one school. And we've grown, but other organizations, uh, often what they'll do is they'll bring us in to do the training but when they get large enough, they'll start doing it themselves. And so uh, many groups now are doing training, uh, but it's a big country with a lot of demand. So quite frankly, the more the merrier. Um, good example is uh, Turning Point. Uh, Charlie Kirk uh, is LI trained. And uh, when he started Turning Point, um, he brought Leadership Institute in to do tra training at, uh, at his conferences. Uh, but I understand now uh, they've grown so large, they've decided to start a training arm of what they do, which is terrific because they've grown so large, they have a real demand for training, and now they're going to start doing that themselves. Um, but there are many groups now that, that have an element of, of training to them, and that's all to the good. Yeah, that's very good. As long as the originality doesn't go. I mean, Martin Blackwell's um, vision was amazing. As long as people stick to the quality, right? Uh, 
I think that's all it is. So Steve, many people seem to be totally disillusioned with the country's current political climate, and I don't blame people at all. What would you say to the candidates to encourage them to get involved? Let's talk even about 11th Congressional District or Fairfax GOP, or Fairfax County for that matter. We have 1.2 million people. We uh, time and time again after election cycle, we end up being no matter how much we try, I've been in the community trying to do minority engagement, regardless of what we do, we still turn out to be 32%, 34%. So what do what would you say to these um, people that want to run but are discouraged, uh, but uh, uh, look at the country's current political climate and are like, I wish I could do something. How do you motivate them to get involved? That's a great question because it, it's, uh... Uh, it's related to running to do something or running to be somebody. So if you're running to do something, you can run for office, not win, and still have a huge impact. There's, there's no better way to organize people than running for office, because people understand that. They understand volunteering, what to do, going door to door, making phone calls, donating, voting, getting people organized. It's, it's really community organizing but with a candidate and a campaign as a structure to do it. So there's no better way to, uh, if, if there was no political campaign, try organizing hundreds or thousands of people. Uh, it's, it's more difficult. So to run to, uh, yes, you want to win, but if you don't win, keeping the organization intact for a purpose after the election um, is very important. Uh, also, so I believe that we should run people everywhere because of that organizational component. And so when the campaign is over, if you've got 33%, well, that's terrific. You try to identify that 33% and you know who your volunteers are, you know who your donors are. Um, when Oliver North ran for the US Senate, he didn't win, but he created an enormous political action committee with the people that had donated to him for the campaign and said, the fight is not over. The war continues. We lost this battle, but we're going to continue. And he encouraged people to donate to his political action committee and remained active for decades later. For all I know, it's still going on, quite frankly, his, his pack. And so if you give people a, a, a things to do, projects and a vision, and keep them engaged and active in other ways, we, we need people to show up at school board meetings. We need people to monitor how Republicans as well as Democrats. We need an organization to hold their feet to the fire. We need people to uh, uh, circulate petitions on specific issues. There's so many things that can be done after an election is over, but too often the election is over, that's the end. We collect the yard signs. At best, they end up in someone's garage uh, and the organization falls apart. And in two years, the next person is starting from scratch. And so we need to avoid that. So I, I think that happened in 2010 after the Tea Parties, uh, won a huge victory. The left was destroyed after 2010 in that election. Look where we are 12 years later. It's, it's amazing because we, we, we lost track. We, we took our eye off the prize. And I'm hoping it's rare you get another chance so soon. But I think that uh, 22 and 24 are going to be equally uh, strong for conservatives. And hopefully we've learned a lesson to stay involved, stay engaged after the elections are over and hold the people we elected accountable and, can, and move on from there and continue. The left, left does that. The left stays engaged. We're, absolutely. absolutely. We're, we're productive people and we're busy people and we elect good people and we assume they're going to do the right thing and we go back to our lives and then it falls apart. Let's not let that ha happen again. I think we, we, so we very soon take our eyes off the prize and we start from scratch again. I think you got that right. So very wise thoughts. Uh, so, so, so Steve, do you guys do training for both rural and urban population? I'm always concerned that um, uh, there is lack of rural voters turn out when you know they all share our values. So do you go around there and do that too? Do trainings? We do. Um, again, it depends on how many and how far uh, and how many people. But, but the rural communities are very motivated. So when we do a, a, 
a training in a so-called rural area, uh, we'll, we'll get good, uh, good attendance. Uh, most of our trainings tend to be kind of regional in nature, so we publicize it, or the, the, the hosting organization publicize it, uh, publicizes it amongst their membership. And so we get pretty good turnouts, particularly now. There's no shortage of activists. Our mission is to increase the number and effectiveness of conservative students, activists, and leaders. Well, the Biden administration has taken care of half of our mission, increasing the number. The, the numbers are there. Now we just have to train them what to do. And so we're, we're very active. Uh, this weekend, we were doing a training in, in Boise, Idaho, for example. Um, and that's a city, but still, it's a, it's a smaller place. We, we travel all over the country and even internationally uh, doing trainings. And so um, it's just a question of what people want to do and what the resources are, how many people we can train at a time. And uh, we just did a youth leadership school that had almost 300 students, a record number, uh, just earlier this month in, in July. And, uh, but we do, we do youth leadership workshops on college campuses for 10 people, for 10 students on that campus if they, if they want us to. Of course, that's a three hour training. The youth leadership school is a full weekend. So yeah. well, we'll work with, people will call us, give, give us a call, give me a call if people want to, and, and, and we'll work with them and figure out what makes the most sense that we can do cost effectively. And uh, yeah, so yeah. I'll Steve, talk with people one-on-one -on -one if they want to. You know? They can call me and I'll, I'll, I'll teach you how to raise money, Shri, and, and give you an hour, you know, and uh, uh, you should still come to the school. But if people have questions, there's so much that we have to offer, so many resources, the right people to talk to, and uh, we'll get people's questions answered. Steve, Steve, I'm not sure if I can afford you one on one, but I'll come to the group lessons for sure. <laughs> Free. <laughs> yeah, thank uh, you. I am paid by the Leadership Institute. There is no, there are no fees. Uh, we appreciate uh, that very much. The cost much. of the schools is, is, is usually very nominal. It's, it's to pay for the lunch usually. And uh, you can call me anytime and I might be worth what you pay, but you're paying zero. <laughs> Steve, that's very, very kind of you. I mean, you are absolutely right. Fee for these trainings are low cost or no cost sometimes. I mean, yes. I have to thank your generous donor base you have for Leadership Institute that you actually cultivated the relationship and built the donor base. Um, Steve, are there any religious institutions? Well, if I can, Shri, if I can if I just add, I just spoke to a group on Monday and they, they sent me a, a, a $250 as a thank you. And I, I just called them up and said, I'm, I, I can't, I'm not going to take that. I, you know, we raised a lot of money last year than you did, your organization. You know, we raised $29 million last year. So our donors pay for, 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 the, for the training and for the services that we provide. So I'm, I'm giving that check back and they were very happy and, and uh, it was very nice of them to do it, but very unnecessary. Wow, wow. So what about religious institutions, Steve? I mean, there is a lot of um, disgruntlement among religious institutions that um, um, the, the country is kind of uh, going to uh, become one of those uh, places with no religion or there is really no li religious liberty anymore. So have you had these religious institutions reach out to you in order to partner so you can provide training to them as well? Yes. In fact, the group that I mentioned just just uh, was a is a religiously oriented, uh, family oriented organization uh, in South Carolina that wanted me to speak to their interns uh, about opportunities uh, to get more involved. And so uh, absolutely, uh, um, we just hired a, uh, for our campus groups, we just hired a, uh, a Christian uh, staffer uh, well, for Christian groups on campuses, which we've never had before. So uh, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, because people realize they need to get involved. Absolutely. Or they're going to be in trouble. And so, um, so yeah. So, Steve, yeah, as just, you know, uh, I said this is Fairfax County, right? Uh, Fairfax County, um, as you might realize, uh, minorities and immigrants are over 50%. Uh, 
And sometimes the messaging has to be a little different, although all our values are the same. Me being very engaged in minority communities, uh, I'm always concerned that traditional education might not really, they can connect the dots, let me put it that way. So um, I have two part question. So if you're teaching for those kind of um, communities, is your messaging any different? Or are there any even outreach activities that you do so these folks can take classes and trainings? Because I think there is issues that they don't really come out and take these classes. Um, and second thing is, is messaging should be slightly different, how you say it should be different because values are the same, but they won't connect the dots between conservatism and liberalism. Great question. And um, we do many hours of message and communications training in our campaign management school. And, and we go through that. It's a, and and uh, as you said, it is similar but it's different and, and you, have to, you have to work through that. And each community, it's slightly different. But as a general rule though, the messaging is for the most part the same. Uh, a good example, Myra Flores, who just won that seat in Texas, she is LI trained. Uh, she attended two trainings in Texas. Uh, we did grassroots training in Texas. We're very active there. And I think she went to her first LI training in 2019. And then she took another one uh, a year or so ago before she ran for Congress. And she learned uh, in part some of the messaging. And now her message was different, but how to do it, she learned. And then, and her message on her yard signs, she had three words in addition to her name, which I thought was brilliant. What are the three most important things in the Hispanic community? And they were on her yard sign, God, family, and country. Hmm. That's pretty good. Yes. And she was elected, you know, in this huge upset, which I think uh, is indicative of many victories we'll have later this year. So um, I've been surprised it's taken so long for some minority communities to embrace conservatism and republicanism, but I think that's happening. Uh, usually you would see it gradually occur over several election cycles. But it's happening, it's happening in one cycle now. People have seen, the left has exposed themselves for who they are and parents and people who love country and God are realizing how they, their policies will destroy our families, our communities and our country. And it's, it's that serious. And they realize that now. So that's why I think it's gonna be a huge victory um, with a huge coalition that we had never seen before. And, uh, uh, but we still have to do outreach and we, and, and we are, and, and people are showing up. So that's, that's great uh, to know, Steve. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what will be the winning uh, formula for us. We just really need to get them understand that we all value the same thing. Again, who can defeat the message of God, family and country? I mean, what else is out there that is better than that? So and, Steve- uh, and to, yeah. and to, and to, uh, and to the point, though, we teach that you need your message should contrast with the other side. And the fact that the other side now has a problem standing for God, family, and country, they can't say that because they don't believe it, and, they don't, and the policies undermine all three. So they're in, they're in very big trouble because they've let, uh, they've exposed themselves for who they are. Usually they lie better uh, okay. than they have, and they can't control their, their, their base anymore. So uh, people are waking up to that. And, and, and I, I think, because we treat everyone as Americans, that's what unites us. We're all Americans. You know, I can't go to Mexico and be Mexican. I can't go to France and become French. But people from those countries can come here and embrace the constitution and all of that, it, 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 uh, that, uh, that entails. And they can be American. And that's what unites us. And that's what the left doesn't understand and refuses to acknowledge. So as they separate people and divide people based on race and religion and sexual orientation, the more that they, uh, they show the difference, diversity, diverse, divides. That's the root of all three words. It is divisive uh, or divisive, depending on how you pronounce it. But we're the uniters. 
And sometimes that gets lost, but I think people are coming to realize that now. And I think you're, you're gonna see a huge coalition that will destroy the left in this country and hopefully bury it for at least a generation, if not more. Absolutely. Steve, I know you were talking about the campus reform. I know a lot of uh, young people um, are getting exposed to left-wing bias on American campuses. So when you go to those uh, campus reform sessions in colleges, how do you actually expose that? How do you expose this left-wing bias? That's uh, a great question. We have a network of campus correspondents throughout the country, and there's students on college campuses. And we, we, we've had over 100 recently uh, per year, and they investigate the stories. They're the ones that share the stories with our campus reform staff. And I would say for every story we print, we don't print probably two stories. So they're, they're well-researched, um, uh, balanced, but they will expose the bias and indoctrination of the left on college campuses. The students, if your story's printed, I think you get a small stipend of $75. And uh, uh, we've had some students make thousands of dollars uh, because they have a network uh, of their high school friends that have gone to different colleges that are feeding them stories. And, uh, um, but they're heavily researched. And so that's, that's how that network works. We wanted to take advantage of the unique network that we have of campus groups on college campuses. We have over 2000 campus groups of conservative campus uh, students, conservative students on campus. So that's a network that's pretty strong. So how did we, how, how to maximize that? Well, let's ask them for information if they feel that there's bias or indoctrination going on on their campus. And there's no shortage of that. We think we've pushed back uh, pretty successfully. You don't see very many speakers being shouted down anymore because we had a specific project to, to, to deal with that. And the pushback was very strong on our side and now those speakers are being allowed to speak. You don't see them being shut down as much. That's as very, good. very good to know because uh, the, if they, I know they, uh, I listened to Dinesh D'Souza quite a bit and uh, he mm -hmm. was shut down multiple times on, in these college campuses. So Steve, I also see uh, that Leadership Institute has several podcasts such as Tech Talk to Experts, Take on the Latest in Digital Technology, Learn Right for School Board Campus, um, I mean, I literally urge everyone to view them on Instagram, TV, and YouTube. I listen to them. I view them when I have a chance. Uh, you guys really are uh, uh, pushing out some cutting edge stuff out there. I can tell you that. Um, so at the end, Steve, I think- want to learn, If people want to learn how to do those, we do training on how to put those on and how to, uh, how to create the content. Uh, Steve, I think uh, uh, we lost. Uh, and Stephen Rowe, R-O-W-E, is director of our digital. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Or, uh, now I can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Now I can hear you, yes. So Stephen Rowe, R-O-W-E, he is the director of our di digital training pro uh, programs, and we teach how to do it. So the content is great. People should view it. But if you want to create your own content, uh, you should come to some of the training and learn how to how to uh, how to how to do it. We teach that too. Absolutely, no. This is very informational, Steve. I think this is one of your quote. You said democracy is not a spectator sport to be watched from sidelines. It is participatory and civil obligation to be involved at some level. And you also went on to say we have ceded the battlefield to the left for too long. It is time to take it back. I thought that was just amazing. And you're living the life of it in the sense you are not just passing out the statements and sitting back. You're right in the trenches, uh, trying to. You're being an educator. You're being a leader. You are trying to help people where their most weaknesses is, which is fundraising. So I thank you. I thank you so much for not only joining us but doing so much. Uh, community service as such for uh, conservative world. Uh, there are not many institutions as a leadership institute and please note that we appreciate the organization and we appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Uh, I thank you for joining us. Uh, this has well, been- It's only because of our donors. It's because of our donors and Morton Blackwell's leadership and vision. And okay. he's just created a, a wonderful thing and he's truly a, a living legend in my, in my mind.
Absolutely, absolutely. We can't uh, not, we can't do any of these with low cost or no cost without those val valuable donors that actually believe in the cause. This has been a wonderful conversation, Steve. I know we had little issues, I think minor issues were for the reception, but overall I was able to hear, I hope our viewers were able to hear you. Your message was clear. I hope more people will take advantage of the Leadership Institute. I know I will for sure. It is an organization that is creating a strong foundation to next generation of conservative leaders. Anytime you are interested in knowing a little more about minority engagement, as you know, it's not a monolithic community. Communities, please, please let us know. We are doing a lot of minority en engagement and we would love to partner with you. Terrific. Well, call us anytime. Thank you. Viewers, thank you all for joining us this evening on the Friday evening. Do want to let you know that next week on Saturday, July 30th at 6 p.m., we will have Reese Smith, who is a state chair of high school Republicans. Uh, young Republicans. Uh, we also will have as a panel Luke Sweet Swetnam. He's a vice chair, and uh, Sam Widener. He's Northeast Regional Director for the High School Republicans. All three of them will work as a panel. Uh, will kind of come in as panelists, and we'll have a great session next week. Next week as well. Please share the video far and wide in conservative circles and even in independent circles. We really wanna make sure we expand our tent and we want as many people as possible to listen to this pulse of I said, words of wisdom from Mr. Sutton. Please tune in and continue to support. Have a great evening. God bless you all and God bless America. Thank you.